All right. Um, John, do we need to do a sound check on online? Are we good? Okay, great. Hey, just give me a real quick idea of, uh, like by raise of hands, like sales students, okay, marketing, and then what other different disciplines would be in here? Go ahead. Uh, parks and Recreation. Wow, okay, that's pretty cool. All right, anyone else? Art. Art, okay. Management information systems. Nice, okay. Yeah. Psychology. Psychology, wow. You're gonna analyze me this whole time, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to be here. I uh, had the opportunity to do this last year as well. I want to thank Dr. Bone, uh, John Ambrose, uh, Tanya Davis, and the entire university uh, for what they've done for us, working with MarketStar, working with Pinterest and so forth. Our sales competition last year was the first time that we had done this. And uh, as with anything that you do the first time, we learned a lot from it. And I think we'll do better this time around, but uh, we'll probably learn from this time as well. So for those of you who are competing, I look forward to you coming and helping us to make that even better. For those of you who aren't, perhaps you'll consider that for the next year because we want to continue to grow this and make it that much better. So Dr. Bowen, how long do I need to take so I can leave time for questions and everything else and more than anything else before people just get up and leave? Okay. You manage how you want. Okay, okay, that's great. And then uh, welcome to all of those who are online. Um, that may be one, that may be more than one. And I think we're going to have you just uh, send any questions that you may have, and, and John will yell those out. But what I want to do for the next little while is talk to you all about digital media, uh, advertising, sales, marketing, everything else, and try to bring some real-world experience as well. What I hope that this will do will give you some information for those who are competing that will help you with that. We're going to follow up with a presentation from the Pinterest team, specifically to the ad units on Pinterest and how they sell them and so forth. And another presentation about creating proposals and selling, which many of you I know have a pretty good feel for anyway. What I really want you to know is that this needs to be interactive. If I'm up here till 4.15 and you're falling asleep, then I haven't done what I really want to do. I want it to be high energy. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to ask a lot of questions. And there's more material than I can get through in this time. So if I skip through a couple of slides to get to some meaty things, just understand that. Um, and I'm happy to share the deck with you because I know there's nothing you'd rather do than read this tonight when, when you get ready to go to bed. Uh, so that said, how many of you have ever worked anything uh, from an advertising standpoint, done anything in advertising, either graphics design or sales or whatever? Okay, interesting. Um, anybody, was this all in the valley here? Anybody outside the valley? Where? Uh, Las Vegas and Florida. Las Vegas. And remember, remind me your name because I know we had you last year. Yeah, Kent Nelson. Kent, okay. Las Vegas and Florida. Yeah. Okay. Got my first degree in Florida and then moved to Las Vegas and then Nice. Okay. All right. Others outside the valley here. Okay. How about inside the valley? What, who, tell me kind of some of the businesses you've done advertising for in the valley here. Anyone? Uh, mostly biotech. Uh, Thermal Fisher Sciences. Thermal Fisher. Okay. Yep. On the way in. And Quantus Biosciences, GE Healthcare. Okay. Nice. Nice. Anyone else? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, a small uh, auto mechanic shop. Cool. So maybe social media and so forth? Social media and then like designing a few just things like print material. And yeah, so that's pretty cool. How about you? I've that's, that's done some radio ads for the cities. Nice, nice. Were you the voice talent? Uh, I was in a few of them and I recruited somebody better. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what I want to do is help you understand what my principle is, which is that two things when it comes to business and when it comes to advertising, nothing happens till someone sells something. All right. If you're not a sales major, if that's not what you want to do, I get that. That's fine. There are a lot of other things out there, but I'm going to say that from a sales standpoint, most anything that happens happens because something was sold, right? The laptop you have that you're taking notes on, someone sold that to you. Uh, the clothes you have, you bought uh, at the store or, or whatever the case may be. The building gets sold, if you will, from donors, everything else. Sales really is the lifeblood of business. That's what keeps businesses going and helps them to grow. So for those of you who are sales majors, I want you to think about that with regards to digital advertising and digital media. For those of you in marketing or other disciplines, I want you to think about, you don't need to sell it, but how would you position it? How would you use digital advertising, digital media, advertising in general to help to move a product, to educate, to drive interest and awareness, and ultimately to ring the cash register? Because if you are going to go into any business discipline, if you go into a business that doesn't have any sales, you're not there very long, right? 
businesses have to have sales because without that, they don't survive. So as we go through some of this, like I said, please throw up some questions, but three things that I want to make sure that you feel comfortable with is this is just foundational. All right. There's a lot of things that we're going to go really quickly through and you can't possibly feel really great after this that you just know everything and that's okay, right? Get a base level, but if you have other questions afterwards or if you want to send me an email and I can answer something, happy to do that. We're going to give you a lot of terminology. The ad tech world is full of acronyms and so forth. What I love about it is it's very dynamic. It's changing all the time, but because of that, it's hard to get your arms around everything because it is changing all the time. So I'll give you a little bit of that. And then finally, just want you to understand kind of the technology. So uh, who was the MIS right there, right? MIS. So the technologies and so forth, not just how do you sell it or uh, how do you position it, but a little bit about the tech behind that. But this is one of my favorite quotes. I'm an advertising guy and I believe this. This is from a guy named, as you see there, Howard Luck Gossage, who was an advertising executive in the 50s. And he simply said, listen, folks don't read anything that doesn't interest them, but sometimes it's an ad that interests them. So I'm going to ask you by a raise of hands, how many of you absolutely love being served ads online and love commercial breaks? How many of you love ads? Raise your hand. Okay, I get it, right? Ads are not something that we love, but let's be completely honest, whether or not you like the NFL, why do you watch the Super Bowl? <laughs> let's be honest, right? Maybe it's your team that's playing, and if it isn't, and you still want to watch it for that, but I guarantee you, you're watching the ads, right? So you might say that you don't love ads. I get that, and I'm not asking you to change that. What I'm saying to you is this. Ads can be content just as anything else. If you read the news, if you watch TV, if you do anything that's entertainment, an ad can be just as entertaining. And in fact, it should do something that touches you to give you a message about a product or cause you to have interest in it or want to buy it or whatever. So what I hope you'll consider is that I'm not talking about bad ads. I'm not talking about bombarding people and making them feel like it's really creepy. What I'm talking about is getting the right ad to the right person at the right time. So let me give you an example. I worked for six years at uh, Desert, Desert Digital Media, which is the parent company of KSL.com, DesertNews.com, Utah.com. I guarantee every one of you has been on at least one of those sites probably, right? And when you've been there, you've seen ads. You go to KSL.com for the classifieds, it's free. You don't pay a thing. What's the currency? It's your eyeballs, right? The trade-off is you can come to our site and sell and buy things for free, but in return, we want to put an ad in front of you. Let me ask you this by raise of hands. How many of you, if ads went away tomorrow, would pay $9.99 a month to go to KSL.com to look at uh, items to buy? But, okay. You're saying, in effect, I'm not willing to pay $9.99, but I'll give you my attention instead. So if you're saying, I don't like ads, I get it. I'm not saying that I need you to love ads. What I'm saying is, is that's a currency. You've chosen to forego paying so that you can actually be able to see something on TV, uh, in a newspaper or in a magazine or something like that in return for your attention. So let me ask you this then. If you are on KSL.com and you have to see an ad, wouldn't you rather see an ad that speaks to you? Wouldn't you rather see an ad that makes sense for who you are and what you have interest in and so forth? Okay, so that's the ad, uh, that's the idea and the job that ads have to do, which is if you're going to have an ad in front of you anyway, why not make it be something that's relevant? So you heard that I'm a cyclist uh, and I love riding loaders every year from uh, Logan here. And so when I see an ad, I'd much rather see something about a new bike, a helmet, shoes or something like that than maybe something that I'm not all that really great at, which is fishing, right? Fishing pole for me probably isn't going to do it. I'm not going to have all that much interest in it. I'm going to go right past it. But there's someone in here who probably does like fishing and would like to see that and wouldn't want to see my bicycle ad, right? Because we all have our different interests and so forth. That's what advertising is there to do is to help you to uh, have the opportunity to see products and so forth that make sense to you. And when they don't, that's why, among other things, that you don't like ads. Now, sometimes you don't like ads because they also uh, insult your intelligence, right? I've seen some of those ads as well. But how many times have you seen an ad that's really funny or that you've enjoyed and it's been something that's been at least worthwhile for you know, a little bit of time that you saw it, just like the Super Bowl. So this is something that I want you to take a look at that happened in 2016. Prior to 2016, TV was king. TV commanded more advertising dollars than any other medium. But as you see here, just barely, right, 71.29 to 72.09, 
Just barely in 2016, digital surpassed TV for the most dollars from an advertising standpoint. And from here on out, it's going to continue to be that way. In fact, this year, mobile itself is going to do more than TV will do. Now, mobile is clearly a big, uh, the biggest part of, of digital. But understand that newspaper, TV, radio, all of those, it's digital now. That's where the dollars are coming from. So that's why we think it's really cool when we do this sales competition with Utah State and Pinterest because that's what's going to happen in the future. It's all going to be about digital. If you're interested in advertising, you're interested in sales, digital is a great place to be. Now, I'm not saying for anybody who is listening that that doesn't mean that TV or newspaper or radio or other type of ads aren't a good place to be. It's just that they won't grow the same way that digital will. And so if you want to be where the growth is, you're going to want to be with digital. So let me ask this question. And I'm not above uh, giving out some gifts to, uh, to get some answers. I brought some nice Marcus Star swag here. So we're going to go for a, a Marcus Star bottle. All right. Um, you see a question here and you've got four answers. Um, someone who would raise their hand and go out on a limb and tell me what you think the answer is. What do you got? C88.5. Uh, okay, that answer is locked. Anybody want to guess anything else? I mean, you got three other chances and there's still a water bottle there. Okay, what do you got? I'll go B. You're going to go B? All right. Anyone else still want to? Because it's a bottle, right? You want it? Go ahead. I'm going to go D. You're going to go D, and I guess you're going to go A or you're out, right? Yeah, One or the other. I'll go A. Okay, so here's what it looks like. The answer is C, right? Tell me your name. Uh, Curie. Okay, Curie, congratulations. Thank you. So, Absolutely, by far, you can see here that uh, Americans are online, right? We know that. We know that we spend more time on our phones than on our TVs, than on desktops, than on anything else. There's more time consumed on a phone than any other thing that we do with regard to entertainment and news and so forth. Why is that? Accessibility. Accessibility. Okay, that's great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about mobile and uh, desktop and everything else. Um, I don't even want you to tell me how old y'all are because I know you're way young, all right? And it just is going to make me feel bad. But some of you may remember some of these. A lot of these brands up here are still around and we interact with them. But take a look at that timeline, all right? 1994, I actually worked for AOL, which was back then called America Online, when they acquired Netscape and the first Netscape browser. And it was on dial-up. I don't, you guys don't even know what it is, right? I mean, you do, but let's be honest, right? And it was slow as can be, but it was the coolest thing in the world because it gave us access to something that we had never been able to see before. All the way to the other end of Snap, right? Snap completely gives you different access to different people and to all of the things that you can do on your story and, and, and discover and so forth. In between all of that, there's been a lot of really great things that have happened. And most every one of those you see there, you don't pay for Right? You pay for a couple. You pay for iTunes. Uh, you may pay for Amazon Music. You could now pay for YouTube. In the past, you couldn't pay for YouTube, right? You just got it for free. So there's been a lot of innovation that's gone on. And you can see some of the growth of internet users. Two billion users in 2010. High-speed internet took kind of a long time to get there. You guys don't even think about high-speed internet anymore. That's just a given, right? And if there's no Wi-Fi, you're like, I'm out of here. Right? When you go to Starbucks and they've got Wi-Fi, that's great, or McDonald's, somebody who's got free uh, internet access, you're not going to a place that doesn't have it. I go to Target and I'm getting free Wi-Fi, right? So that's part of what keeps things going with regard to advertising, is that you have these products that you're accessing, and in return for your attention, you're giving your eyeballs so that you can have the opportunity to hopefully see a good ad, one that will speak to you. Don't worry about all of this here. That's a lot of noise and everything else. I just want to call out three things here that I've pointed out here for you, okay? This is where I, I'm going to sound really old, and you guys, I, you, I get it, right? 1993, it took 10 minutes to download one song and 30 minutes at low speed, one song, right? Nobody even downloads them anymore, right? We just do Apple Music. We do Spotify. We don't even own the music anymore. We don't care. Over here, a low quality movie would take 28 hours at full speed or three and a half, three to five days at low speed. Netflix, right? It's immediate. Amazon Prime, they're immediate. Things have changed completely because of this technology. And that's part of what you have an opportunity to consider with regard to advertising and everything else that goes on. Won't worry about the rest here, but 
Check this one out. In 2011, seven years ago, AOL still added 200,000 dial-up customers. Seven years ago. Where do you suppose most of that comes from? What part of the U.S., I should ask better, or what part of... Let me just tell you, because I'm not asking the question well. <laughs> it comes from rural, rural areas, right? Where broadband maybe isn't there. Way out in North Dakota, in the plains there, where maybe you still have dial-up. There are still people using dial-up because that's the way that they get to the internet. Okay, so take a look at this. It's pretty daunting, but that is the growth of, as you see here, worldwide of internet users from 95 to 2017. If you were a business owner and that were the sales stats of your company, would you be pleased? Absolutely, right? That's incredible growth. And I did some calculations here just really quick, and all I'd ask you to do is look at that very last uh, column on the right-hand side there, the time that it took from one step to the next. I just went in deciles from 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50. What do you notice there? As you're going from 10 to 20 to 30, what's happening? It's taking less time, right? It's taking less time as the growth is going on there, which means it's becoming exponential. Now, at some point, we get to the point where everybody's on. So that's a little bit different. So let's talk a little bit about the formats of advertising and how that works. And I want to get some terminology in front of you that you probably, it probably makes sense, but I just want to make sure that you think this through. So when we talk in, in digital advertising about desktop, it's both laptop and desktop, but most of the time it's just a laptop, right? We rarely use desktops anymore. Most everybody in here who uh, is either taking notes is probably on a laptop or maybe on a phone or a tablet. Mobile is phone and tablet, but are there other uh, options that you can receive ads on? Digitally, what else? Right there, right? My Apple Watch. What else? You got connected TVs, right? You got Amazon uh, Alexa, which is really, really cool. And they now are starting to have ads even on Alexa, right? Anywhere you can put an ad, people are going to put an ad. But there's all different kinds of ways that you can reach consumers. It's not just about the right message. It's about getting them at the right time. And that's going to be on all these different devices when it makes the most sense. All right? Do you think that ads on an Apple Watch do all that well? John, what, you're shaking your head no. Why? Well, I just feel like it's so easy to just put my wrist down as the intention is going. Okay, right. So you don't have me as a captive audience. And how often do I look at my watch? I have to be looking at the right time to see the ad. And even if I do, it's tiny, right? It's not going to do a lot for me versus on my big screen TV when I might see something on a commercial break when I'm watching a program, right? So, another test. And uh, we'll do another water bottle here. So, we got four answers there. I want you to tell me what you think gets the greatest amount of its traffic, 80% of its traffic, uh, or where the traffic comes from. Finance, social media, retail, entertainment. Who's going to give me an answer? Okay, what you got? You want to go D, entertainment? Okay, that's a good one. That one's out. Someone else, what do you got? Uh, B, social media. Social media, B. Anyone got an A or a C? A. C? A. a, there we go. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, so 80% social media, right? 80% from mobile. Tell me why. And tell me who that was. I, 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 see, that's how quickly I forgot it. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me your name. Morgan. Morgan, all right. Why does... Uh, Mobile get 80% traffic from social media. Go ahead. Well, there's several of the social media platforms that are optimized for mobile, like Instagram. It, it's, it's basically made for mobile, even though you can do it on other things. So, and, and that's true for a lot of the different platforms. Okay. okay, so I love that. When's the last time you took a photo and said, I can't wait to get home and put this on Instagram? Right? That's not, it, it's just not how it happens. As you said, it's optimized for that format. So social is very good in driving traffic from mobile, and mobile gets its traffic from social and so forth. But there are other options, right? And you, uh, entertainment, retail, finance, those are all things you also do on your phone, right? I'm an America First member. I, I'm doing my banking on my phone all the time. I'm sure you all are, are, are doing something like that as well. But social media is absolutely driven by mobile. Let me just point you a couple things on this. It's somewhat of an eye chart, but let me just point out uh, a few things here. And again, in the 18 range, 
take a look at, uh, so the orange is mobile only. The lightish blue is multi-platform, meaning mobile and desktop and so forth, and then desktop only. Someone point out a couple of things that you quickly glean from this about who uses what and what their ages are and if it's growing or shrinking. What, just tell me what you find there when you look at that. What do you see? Okay, go. People are using everything. Okay. It's not, we're not isolating just to one device, especially that uh, 35 to 54. Okay. They're, they're connected with all sorts of different platforms, so one, it's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. Okay, so first of all, I love that. A lot of folks don't necessarily think that through. If you think the desktop and laptop, you don't need to optimize for your advertisements and your sales and so forth, you're wrong, right? Right there in the middle. What else? Uh, I think there was a hand over here, right? Somebody here? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. So if you just look blue, dark blue versus dark blue, right? Very little desktop, a lot more desktop. But the flip is also the same, right? If you look at mobile versus mobile, right? It's over here a lot more and a lot less there. Just keep that in mind because not only do you need to serve the right ad to the right person at the right time, you need to do it on the right platform as well. There are ads that don't make a lot of sense on, uh, even on Instagram, right? Because you're flipping through your feed so fast that's one of the most difficult things to do is to try to get somebody's attention when they're going through a news feed. But you can do it. So you've got to think through how these things get done. So think about a couple of things real quick. Think about, and by the way, if you don't have a desktop, that's okay. Desktop and laptop. That's why I wanted to get the terminology out there. Think about what you access on desktop that's different on mobile. And somebody tell me something that you do more on desktop, desktop or laptop, than you would do on mobile that you would access. What do you got? That's cool. Okay. Because why? Because I like to read it right away, but then I want to make sure that I have it typed and grammar and everything. On desktop. Okay. That's really cool. So you, uh, you're doing a one way, con con uh, you're consuming content this way, and then you're pushing out the other way based on what makes the most sense for you. I want to read it and get it right now, but then I want to make it sure the punctuation, the spelling, everything else is great. And it's tough like that. Okay. What else? Someone else. Yeah. Streaming like Netflix, Hulu. I don't want to you actually do more on desktop? Wow, that's cool. Um, why not on a phone? Uh, usually if I'm gonna sit down and like watch an episode of something, I'm gonna be like at my house anyway, and it's gonna be a bigger screen, better sound. Okay, okay. That right there is a key for you to think about when you think about formats, when you think about size of screen and everything else. Phone is great, but if I'm at home and I've got broadband, so it's not about data plan anyway, I might as well get it on a bigger screen, right? But could you have uh, Netflix on your TV at home? But you're still choosing your laptop. Why? Maybe someone else is on the TV streaming something else. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's cool. Uh, yeah, please. Facebook. I don't like the app, and so I never had it. Okay. Okay. That's cool. So for you, it's about uh, you like the aesthetic or you like the usage or something about the desktop version of, uh, of, the app, or of Facebook more than the app. There's like so much content on Facebook that it's all like smashed and it's hard to see or navigate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So tell me your name. Veronica, if you're a marketer, you're an advertiser, and you want to target Veronica on Facebook, and you create the ad for mobile, you're never going to get her, right? Literally, you don't even have the app. You're never going to get her, right? You think I'm looking for a female in this age demographic. We'll just call it really young because it is, right? If I'm looking for a female in a really young demographic, and I want to get her on Facebook, and so I'm going to create a mobile ad, I'm going to miss someone. You're thinking, oh, you know what? Uh, kids are only on mobile. Let's not do desktop. Well, obviously, that's wrong. Right? It's wrong. Okay, so the next one is, what are the types of things that you use your browser for on your phone? Not an app. What are the things you would actually go to a browser for that you don't open an app for? And I get that Safari and Chrome are apps, okay? I get that. But let's call them browsers in this case because I'm talking about not a self-contained app. What are you, and maybe you don't, what do you open up your browser for on your phone, please? Okay, okay, so, um, and are you going directly to Wikipedia or are you Googling it? Often I'll Google. Okay, okay, that's cool. Someone over here, yeah. Yeah, I'll look for restaurants on it. I'll just Google like different restaurants near me. Okay, all right. Maybe. Okay, yeah. I actually do use it to get on social media, but only to look at things, not to interact. I only interact on, on my desktop. 
Okay, so that's somewhat similar here. So you actually aren't using the app on your phone to interact with it. You're just going browser. And then when you want to interact with it, then it's on your laptop. That's really cool. There's one more over here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Isn't that true, right? Isn't that true? But now let's ask you this. When you're Googling, how many of you aren't even doing this or this anymore? What are you doing? Okay, Google, right? It's voice, right? You're doing the voice search as well. Okay, and then the last one. If you have a tablet, and many of you don't, and that's okay, maybe some of you do, um, what do you use it for? Go ahead. Uh, Netflix, that's usually what I use. Do you use it for anything else but Netflix? Okay. Point, okay. Yeah. I mean, I used to use it for like Facebook. Okay. Just it was so it's basically a mini TV. Yeah, it, it, it is a mini TV. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Note taking. Note taking. Okay. Uh, do you handwrite the notes? Do you type them? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Like uh, I use my Kindle to read books on. Okay. All right. So think about that. Very specific use cases, right? So if you think to yourself, I want to target somebody on a, a tablet, and if, you're not, if it's not an app that's ad-supported, Netflix uh, you have to pay for, although they're yeah. going to start putting ads in as well. And in, in this case, um, Kindle sometimes uh, have would have an ad, right? They have yeah. ads um, before you open okay. Kindle and like what okay. it Okay, all right. I'm going to speed up because I can see that I'm already going a little too slow because y'all are interacting really well. But I want you to just look at this. You may have seen this before. This is kind of the corollary to that earlier graph. Take a look at, based on ages, what the top eight apps are that are being used. And this is by unique visitors, so this is by traffic, okay? This is not by page views. This is just by unique people. Notice that YouTube, it's all across there. Facebook's all across there, right? What do you find interesting in this? Throw out anything you see there that's interesting. What insights do you glean from this? Please. Um, the interesting thing is that for ages 55 and up, they actually have a news app where the other three don't have that news app. I love that. I love that. Okay. But, okay, so let's go with that for a second. So Apple News for these old 55 guys, right? I'm getting there eventually, but I'm not quite there. Um, so what you're saying is 18, 24, 25, 34, 35, 54 don't care about news, right? They don't read news. Um, Go ahead. That's, well, that's actually wrong. They just get their news through different sources. Right. Right? So they're getting news through Facebook, right? Maybe YouTube. Maybe Insta, right? All different ways. And also Snapchat. Snap as well. Okay. Someone else give me one more insight that you get from this. Oh, and, and then I'll tell you one if you don't get this one. Go ahead. Something that I find interesting is I have a younger brother who's obviously younger than 18, and I know Facebook is not even on that list for him. So he's like all about YouTube. He's always watching videos, so it's interesting to see how different it can even be, like going back even further. Okay, I love that. And here's a really interesting thing. My youngest daughter just graduated from high school. She's 18. Um, and so she got off Facebook for one reason. Anybody know why? Because her parents were on it, right? <laughs> She got off Facebook because it wasn't cool anymore, because adults were on it, right? So she went to Snap. Actually, she went to Twitter, and then from Twitter to Snap and so forth. So that's really interesting based on uh, ages and so forth. Here's the other thing I want you to look at real quickly. If I go vertically here, one, two, three, all owned by Google, right? Uh, one, two, Insta's not there. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's three by Facebook. Understand this, 66% of all digital advertising goes through two players, Google and Facebook. 66% of $325 billion in digital advertising goes through those two. Now, 33% of $335 billion is still a lot of money, right? Let's call it 100 billion. But those two take more than anyone else. Okay. so. We won't spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to be thinking about this. You've got Alexa. You've got your Apple Watch. Um, at home, I've got a Nest thermostat, right? We've got all different types of ways that we're connected to the internet and things that can help us with that. But it's not going to take long before any one of those could have an ad on it, right? Any one of those. But it's got to be the right place, the right time, the right opportunity, and so forth. So 
Real quick quote here that uh, is from a little while ago. But what she's saying is this. We can't do things the way we've always done them from an advertising standpoint. If we were still trying to do advertising on a laptop like we did in a newspaper, it wouldn't work. You guys are young, but when the internet really took off, it literally looked like a newspaper on the screen. Dr. Bone, right? It was laid out the same. And when we start talking about display ads, that's why display ads are rectangles. Because the internet followed newspapers. When you look in your newspaper or your magazine, Rectangles and squares, right? Nothing has changed when it comes to display because they simply followed the way that newspaper works. So I love to show this slide. And this is a huge one in the digital advertising industry. Everybody knows these. These are called the Lumascapes. Everybody knows them. There's one for video and display, native advertising and so forth, but they all set out the same way. Here's an advertiser or a marketer on this end. And here's a consumer they're trying to reach on the other end. Every one of those logos is a company in between those that does something to facilitate it. Either it's um, a, a publisher that actually has ad space or an ad tech company that does measurement or whatever. Look at that and tell me you don't want to work in a place like that. That's pretty cool, right? It's crazy, right? There is so much opportunity when it comes to something like this, but that's also a real problem too because everything is so fragmented, as we said. So let's start talking about digital advertising. And actually, this is just straight up advertising, but we can, we can think from a digital standpoint. So brands uh, are looking to sell their product, right? So we'll say these brands here. I would venture that maybe except one, maybe except Oscar Mayer. Everybody in here knows all the rest, right? Maybe you haven't had an Oscar Mayer hot dog or, or whatever, but you would know the rest. Those brands are very well known, and they're looking to sell products. There are a lot of different ways that can happen. There's consumers down here, and so oftentimes they go through ad agencies. Now, I've called one out there, Omnicom Group, with the little orange dotted circle there, because that's the parent company of MarketStar. It's one of the world's largest advertising holding companies, and they bought MarketStar in the early 2000s. So that's what's really cool for us, is we get to actually be part of this really great advertising machine that's doing what it's doing. But there's five different holding companies there that have a lot of agencies underneath them. A lot of different ways that we can get to these consumers, media of all kind, and we're trying to reach all different folks, male, female, young, old, interested in cycling, interested in fishing, whatever the case may be. But everyone's basically trying to do this. I have a product, you have a need, let's connect the dots. That's really what sales is all about. Sales is simply you have a solution for someone who has a need, and if you start selling and they don't have the need, don't worry about it. Go find someone who does have the need. Not everyone has a need for your product. That's fine. Here's a different way to look at it. You'll hear a lot of times of what's called the buy side and the sell side. And it's simply this. Sell side are the folks who have the inventory. They've got the slots to sell the ads. They sell those and the advertisers or the agencies, they buy them. Buy side, sell side. Should be pretty simple to understand that. But these are the folks who have inventory, right? So KSL.com. You've all been on that. KSL.com has plenty of ad space and they sell that ad space. And uh, when we first started blowing out uh, KSL and growing it, we went to RC Willie. Everybody knows RC Willie? Most everybody? We said, hey, you guys really need to be on KSL.com. They were doing TV, they were doing newspaper, everything else. And here's what they said. No way, we sell new stuff. I don't wanna be on KSL.com, that's used stuff. It's not bad. As a seller, how do you overcome that? Someone give me a way you would overcome that. I sell new stuff. That's a whole bunch of old stuff. Go. There's people that are selling old stuff. Might be looking to Boom. You need to get a job right now in advertising. If you didn't hear that, that's the right answer. Just because it's used product, RC Willie, someone who is selling a couch is probably doing what? <laughs> Buying a new one. Someone who's looking for a used couch might want to, for a couple hundred dollars more on a special, buy your new couch instead of that used couch. Nice answer, right? So it doesn't really matter what it is as far as the need of the consumer and what the product is. You got folks who sell stuff and folks who are facilitating that. And the idea is, again, like you've heard me say over and over and over, it's getting the right ad to the right person at the right time, because that's what the Super Bowl is for you. It's the right time. It's the right ad. You're there. No one ever says, I hate Super Bowl ads. 
Everybody loves them. I mean, they might be dumb, right? But then you're like, oh my gosh, I got to sit through four minutes of commercials on TV because that's not necessarily the right ad at the right time for the right person. So here's another one. And uh, let's uh, see if we got a different one here. How about a notebook? Nice market star notebook. Okay. Uh, someone tell me, go out on a limb, who's got the first guess? Go. B, 100 million, okay. D. Oh, I'm sorry, D, 1.5 billion, okay. D is closed out, anyone else? Go. I'll do B. You'll do B, all right. D and B. C. C, who's got A? 1.5 billion plus, 1.5 billion plus. Anybody know what the mission statement of Google was when it started? Organize the world's information. With 1.5 billion sites, that makes sense, right? It makes sense that with that, so you're BMW and there's 1.5 billion sites out there. In the US, we have 330 million people. How in the world do you get that done, right? All these different sites and all these different people and I need to sell a BMW to this guy or this gal it gets pretty difficult if you think about it. And that's why I love the challenge of it. So you know all of these publishers, or at least some of them, but sometimes you don't think about some of these as actually being publishers. In the olden days, publishers was like newspaper, right? Or magazines. Publisher means anybody who is publishing news or information or entertainment or anything else. And some of these you may not even think of necessarily as publishers, but they are. Did you know that you can actually be on like a DMV site and you can get an ad? Not every DMV site, right? Some of them, no. Um, Apple, is Apple a publisher? Absolutely, right? Now maybe they aren't doing most of their business via ads, but they are charging for their product. If you like Apple Music and you don't wanna pay, what do you have to put up with? An ad, right? If you like Spotify, you don't wanna pay, what do you gotta put up with? Right, Pandora, same thing. It's just a quid pro quo of I've got something you want, you are someone that I want, and let's make a transaction here. Give me your attention, and I'll let you listen to my songs for free before I show you an ad every four songs, right? That's just how it goes. So there's publishers of all kinds out there. Most of the time, we think about these news and editorial folks as being publishers. Everyone up here is a publisher of some kind, and everyone up there has, here, just so you know what this one is, I've got a calculator app on my phone that's ad-supported, right? How many of you, when you get a chance to download the free app or the paid app, which one do you download? Why? Because it's free, right? 99 cents or free, it's still free, right? Okay, so as we take a look at this, I wanna, I wanna introduce uh, a new uh, term, term for you here in just a minute. But uh, if I go back to this and these 1.5 billion sites, then we take a look at this, and this is uh, a concept called the long tail. You may have heard of this before, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, how many of you know TED Talks? Okay, Chris Anderson, who started TED Talks, was uh, a journalist with a company called Wired Magazine. Some of you may still read Wired Magazine. Back in the days, it was Hot Wired, and then it became Wired Magazine. Chris Anderson is the one who came up with the terminology for the long tail. And what it refers to is that whole long tail thing that way, okay? If you look at this, CNN, NBC, BuzzFeed, Weatherbug, they get a lot of people coming, but there's only a few of those sites. And then there's a whole bunch of sites who get a few people coming. One of the perfect examples of the long tail that Chris Anderson brought out was Amazon early in the day. I know it's cool to buy uh, vinyl right now, records, right? But not long ago, records, nobody was buying them. And so if you wanted to buy a record and you went to a local music store, how good were your chances of finding the record that you wanted? Okay, but if you went to Amazon, how good were your chances of finding it? Okay, someone tell me why. More sellers? More sellers, okay, that's absolutely part of it. There are more sellers on Amazon than that one record store. It's absolutely great, go ahead. Okay, that's perfect. If you are the record store owner and you can only put uh, 300 records in your store, you gotta be selective, right? You're gonna get the ones you think are going to sell. 
Maybe they're not even the ones you like, but they're the ones you think are going to sell. If you're Amazon and you've got these ginormous storage facilities all around the world, you can store anything, right? That's where Amazon came in. Retail has to have a very limited amount of product that a whole bunch of people will buy. Amazon can have a whole bunch of product that only a few people will buy. That's the long tail. So here's how it fits within uh, digital media. And don't mock my skills, all right? This was me breaking it up. That's the same thing. I know that looks just like it, but just go with me, all right? Within the long tail, there's what's called the head, the torso, and the tail. And this holds true for any technology or anything else that you think of at scale. And if you think it through, it would make a lot of sense. There are only a few sites that get a whole bunch of traffic. There are some that get some traffic. And then there are those that get a little traffic. So throw apps out for a minute. Just throw out some names of websites that you all go to on a semi-frequent basis. ESPN. What's that? Twitch, Twitch ESPN. CNN, KSL.com, right? USU.edu. I am there every day. Okay, so someone throw out a site that you go to, I don't know, every once in a great while, six months, nine months. Think of a site that you only go to every once in a while. And if you don't feel like you can say it, that's fine, but. Okay, go. Apple.com. So you and I don't get along because I'm on Apple like every freaking day. I'm an Apple fanboy. Why do you go to Apple every once in a while? When there's a new product release. Okay, new product release. Okay, that's perfect. For you, it would be down in the tail, right? For me, it's like number four there because I'm that guy. Give me another one. Another site that one of you goes to very infrequently, but from time to time you do go. Go. KSL Classifieds. You should try to make me feel bad. Okay, why do you go to KSL Classifieds? I only, buy, I only go there when I'm looking to buy something. Okay. Looking for something specific. Okay, looking for something specific. So you are actually uh, not in the majority. Most folks who go to KSL.com are just there to browse and browse and browse and browse, right? So that's perfect. You go when you have a specific use case. I need a new something for my something or I used something for my something and then I go other than that, I'm not there. Okay, perfect. So that's what the long tail is all about. So if you are an advertiser, where would you say your best bet is to place your ads? You got one of three choices, head, torso, or tail. If you're an advertiser, where should you place your ads? The head? Okay. Dr. Bone, tell me why I would want to go down in the tail. If I'm an advertiser, why would I go down here? What's your thought? Okay, okay, so dead on, right? Let's say that uh, Dick's Sporting Goods is up in here somewhere because it's a lot of traffic, okay? And so that would be in the head and you'd be like, okay, I'm gonna go there to advertise for someone who's buying a fishing rod. That's pretty legit, right? Dick's Sporting Goods carries fishing rods and people who go to Dick's Sporting Goods probably are interested in sporting goods. Well, let's say that way down here on the tail, you've got flyfishingrods.com. See what I'm saying? Where are you going to advertise? Because it's the intent, right? Unless you fat fingered what you typed into the browser. I've never been to flyfishingrod.com. It probably does exist. I've never been there because I'm not a fisherman. But if you go there, you're probably into fishing, right? So if I can throw my ad on here where uh, Dick Sporting Goods is, where maybe it's soccer, maybe it's camping, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's baseball or whatever, I got a one in something chance. Or I go all the way down here. Now let me ask you this. If you're Dick Sporting Goods or your fly fishing rod or whatever I just said, it, who could charge more for their ad? Okay, you got it right. Tell me why this, this one, why? Well, again, like the intent's really high. If someone's going there, there are probably a huge percent chance of actually getting a fishing rod. Okay, okay. So it's all about the targeting. It's all about the targeted audience and who you're trying to reach. All right. Dang, it's going way too fast. So we'll, uh, we'll skip some of these because I want to get to some meat of some things here. Okay. Um, okay, really quickly, because I want you to understand this. In the advertising industry or in media in general, there's three buckets of media called earned, paid, and owned media. Okay? Let me make it really simple for you. Owned media is your own website. 
let's say for just a moment that Utah State is not a university, it's a retailer. Any ads that show up on your site would be owned media, or actually anything that shows up on your site would be owned media. But let's say that Utah State, as a business, advertises on KSL.com, that's paid media. They're paying someone else for that media. So what do you think earned media would be? Go. Cool. Boom, you got it. So when KSL publishes a story about whatever our business here is at Utah State, we earned that, we didn't pay for it, it wasn't on our site, okay? So when you think about owned, earned, and paid media, you also have to think through which of those are going to be the ways that you could find users as well. So let me uh, just walk through this with you, okay? Four different use cases here, and there's one more that I threw in here that's called shared media. I think you can figure out what that one is. So tell me what you think. Upper left-hand corner, this is uh, some website with little dancing people and other things. Awkward family photos, okay? Awkward family photos, and it's a Jeep ad. Is that paid, earned, owned, shared? Why? It's not Jeep site. It's a Jeep ad on someone else's site. Unless Awkward Family Photos gave it to them for free, which I don't think they did, they charge them, therefore it's paid. Very good. So now I'm on Starbucks.com and I've got an ad of my own for some new kind of Frappuccino. What is that? Owned, right? It's my site. I can run all day long. Why wouldn't I want to put a lot of ads on my own site? People are coming there. It's my site, right? So this one down here in the lower left-hand corner, uh, Marissa said, hey, you ought to take a look at this Gerber photo search. What would you call that one? Shared? Yep. And then there's earned, right? When someone says something on Facebook about your brand, that's earned. What's the risk with earned media? What's that? You don't control it. So it might not be a good thing, right? Uh, I know you guys probably don't watch a lot of TV, but you might know um, uh, Bill Gephardt. Bill Gephardt used to come in and tear businesses apart. He'd be the one who'd come in and say, hey, how come you didn't give him the refund or whatever? If you are on Gephardt, that is the worst possible earned media you could want because someone just laid you out in front of everyone else for a crook or whatever the case may be. So you got to think that through. All right. So while we keep on going... Let's talk a little bit about digital ads. There's a lot of different types of digital ads. You've seen a lot of these, and I'm just going to walk through a few of these for you. You've seen search ads, right? Every time you go to Google, you see a search ad, but there are other places where you search. And because you're searching, someone wants to put an ad there. Why? Go. Okay. In the purchase funnel, here's, I'm just kind of learning about it. Here's, I just bought it. Where is search? It's way down, right? Because I'm actually typing in something I'm searching for. Maybe I'm not ready to buy it, but I've got the name of it or I've got some specifics about it. It's further down there, okay? So search is a really great way to do that. And if you've spent any time on Google or any of the other uh, uh, search engines, you'll know that the paid ads go up here and the org organic ads go down here, right? You don't have to pay for organic ads. But how do you become the very first listing in the organic ads? SEO, SEM, right? Yeah. So SEO is going to get you there. And if you don't think you pay to get there, you absolutely pay to get there because you've got to have a lot of things that get you there. But those are the ads, and these are the free ones, if you will. So just some things that I put together with some ads that I see on my laptop for bikes and for Teslas and for Delta and, and things like that. I see these ads all the time because I'm getting targeted for things that I like. You all would see different ads on your machines. But here's where it comes in. This is why the internet looks like it does, because it grew out of newspapers. You had newspaper publishers who said, wait, there's this really great thing called the internet, and I want to reach all those folks out there, so let me pick up my newspaper and put it on the screen. It's pretty much what it is. That's why it looks like this and hasn't changed all that much. Now you get a Facebook and some other things that are all about feeds, Facebook, Twitter, BuzzFeed, and so forth. But this was the model. And every one of those ads there has a name and it has a dimension and it has a different price and so forth. Which of those do you think would be the most expensive ad? Go. This one here? Yeah. Why? Okay, because it's big. That's very good. Which do you think would be the least expensive? Okay. 
Go ahead. The top button's right there? Okay. That's actually a very good thought and probably right, but what, is the, uh, what do the buttons have that the uh, big ad doesn't have? That's actually good. These wouldn't, but that's okay. I, I didn't ask my question all that well. But two things. First, there's two of them, right? They're paired up together. They're actually working together. Notice it's a different creative. They're working together. But they're right next to the brand's name. They're right next to the New York Times, right? Versus maybe down here with something that you weren't paying attention to. So the way you charge for ads has a lot of things that goes into that. It's not just about who you're trying to target or what they're looking for or whatever. You've got static ads. You've got rich media ads. You've got all different kinds of ads that are going to do all kinds of things. You've got mobile ads. Would mobile ads cost less or more than a desktop ad? Depends. Yep. If you were paying by size, you wouldn't pay a lot for that one, right? Because that's pretty tiny. But if that is the right ad at the right person at the right time, you could charge a whole bunch for that even more than that big one that was in the center of the other screen. Desktop and mobile, web and app, there's a lot of different ways to think about how you're going to advertise. And then you've got responsive ads as well. So if you've noticed over the last several years, you'll go to a website and no matter what device you're on, it looks perfect, right? It's called responsive design. And then the ads get designed that same way as well. Because what used to happen was, you, you guys probably remember this, I'd be on my phone and I'd go to a website and it was the actual desktop site and it was so tiny I couldn't read anything. Terrible user experience. So now we've fixed that and we, we serve the ads the right way no matter what the size of the screen is. Take just a minute on native advertising. Native advertising is also known as content advertising, sponsored advertising and so forth. How many of you here have uh, ever looked at BuzzFeed? Okay, I love BuzzFeed, it's really cool. BuzzFeed was really one of the originators of the strong native advertising push. When you go to BuzzFeed, what do you normally get? What are they known for? Listicles, okay? Articles that are lists, you know, 10 things that do this and five things that do that and so forth. But a lot of times those are brought to you by an advertiser. They're sponsored by someone. I'll give you a perfect example. KSL.com, we launched a native advertising product and uh, one of the advertisers that would work with us was Siegfried and Jensen, personal injury attorneys, okay? When's the last time you ever had to call a personal injury attorney? Hopefully not, all right? But they advertised with us for one reason, which is what? When I do need a personal injury attorney, I know Siegfried and Jensen, right? So we did an article that was called 10 Ways to Know That You're a Utah Driver. Okay, sponsored by Siegfried and Jensen. Well, their car crashes, Utah driver, everything else. Didn't once say, hey, come to us when you need us. It was just sponsored by Siegfried and Jensen, but it went viral. It was an incredibly great article, and they got to be attached with that. So when you look at native advertising, it's not always a banner. It could be search. It could be in-feed. It could be all these things. You've seen Twitter ads. You've seen Facebook ads. Those are native. They fit in with the format instead of standing out like those banner ads did, right? Because they've been designed for that site that they're on. And for publishers and for advertisers and for users, there's benefits for every one of those. Every one of those. Here's what they say about uh, native advertising. You guys are millennials. I know you, you believe this way, right? You need to be authentic, you need to be authoritative. When you are doing native advertising, if it doesn't look uh, authentic, people aren't in, right? It can't be uh, something that doesn't fit within either the function or the format or what they're sponsoring. So, let's talk about video. Where do you guys watch most of your video? YouTube? Okay, what else? Netflix? Hulu. Hulu, okay. Um, how many of you only watch video where it's free and don't pay for video? And I'm not talking about your parents give you the Netflix code. Let's not talk about that, right? How many of you watch video, but you don't have to pay for it? So where do you watch video? So just the free stuff. Okay, that's great. Hulu costs how much these days? $7.99, okay. Okay, that's right, that's right. Okay, yep, okay, that's good. Netflix uh, is $11.95 now, $13.95. Okay, I, I, those apps are great, right? They got commercials, yep. but you've said, you've said fine, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go with this, right? Okay, so video has some great uh, benefits 
and video has some really uh, wonderful things it'll do. If you think about video, what does video do that uh, a banner ad can't do? It's got sound normally, right? It's got motion, right? You can actually, go ahead. It's also a form of entertainment as well. Okay, it's form of entertainment. You can uh, actually tell a story. One of the biggest, fastest growing video ads, Google has what they call bumpers that are six seconds long. I would encourage you when you have an opportunity to Google, um, uh, to Google, Google <laughs> six second bumper ads. There's an article that's got like the top 25. Some of them are amazing. Six second ads. You're like, no, you can't tell a story in six seconds. Absolutely, you can. There's a really great one from Under Armour. There's a really great one from uh, one of the dryer sheets, uh, Downey. Six seconds and they're getting the ad across versus 15, 30, whatever the case may be. So video absolutely is good for that. You've got audio. So we actually sell ads at Market Star. We sell ads for Pandora. Pandora is a client of ours. We call small businesses and we say, hey, do you want to reach a user by a certain genre or certain demographic or whatever? And we sell ads, right? So like uh, this ad here could have been us. You've got things uh, like SoundHound that have ads now. Uh, this one I put up here because you don't actually see an ad, but this is actually iHeartRadio, the streaming of the radio. So I'm going to hear a radio ad, right? They're still going to let me have it for free, but I'm going to have to listen to the radio ad because it's a live stream of the terrestrial radio. So a lot of things you can do with audio. You can have audio with uh, a banner. You can have video. Here's what's really cool about Pandora. If I show, it's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one there is to hear it, right? So if I show uh, an ad and no one sees it, does that do me any good? Okay, I'll be out in my garage working and I've got my phone on the workbench and I'm over working on something. I'm listening to Pandora. Did you know that Pandora isn't serving any banner ads to me? The accelerometer says his phone is still, the screen is off, don't serve a banner ad. Why would I serve a banner ad and charge an advertiser for something he's never going to see? I'll get the audio ads. But then I pick it up because I need to search for something real quick. Boom, I get an ad. Tell me how you can do that in newspaper, in magazine or anything else. That's why digital is so cool. The things that it can do. All right. Um, I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. So I'm going to wrap uh, up a couple things here real quick. This was, man, we should do more time. Okay. Um, this is where people say it's creepy. Okay. How many of you have ever searched for a pair of shoes on Zappos? And then what happens for three weeks afterwards? You see that same pair of shoes everywhere you go, right? People think it's creepy. You know why I don't think it's creepy? Because if you're going to show me an ad and I search for the shoes, show me that ad versus something that I don't care about, right? Now, why it's creepy is because some companies aren't good enough to be able to tie the purchase data together to know that two weeks ago I actually bought the shoes and stopped showing me stupid shoes. But if you could stop showing me the shoes but show me for a week, if I've searched for it, it makes perfect sense. So you're on a site. The site will uh, put a cookie on your machine. Cookie is a simple uh, term for a piece of code that goes on your machine. You come back later. It reads the cookie. It says, oh, uh, you saw my ad, but you haven't been on my site. So since you've seen my ad and you haven't been on my site, I know you've seen what I'm showing. And then it can actually still offer that offer to you. Again, can't do that with traditional media. You can't do that with a, a billboard, right? You, you just, that doesn't work. You drive past the same billboard all the time, but you can't do something like this. So digital really has some really great power. We talked a little bit about how ads get priced. If I'm just buying everyone out there, it costs a lot less than if I'm buying males only because now I've cut off half of society, right? And so I've targeted, that costs me more. If I say male plus 18 to 54, that costs me even more. Male 18 to 54 in New Jersey costs me a whole bunch more. But if I am a pizza joint, on a Friday night before uh, a pay-per-view boxing match, that's what I want to be, right? Because that's probably going to be a dude in New Jersey who is hungry, right? So why wouldn't I charge more and why wouldn't I as an advertiser pay more? We can target all different kinds of things. We can target people. We can target location. We can even target something that's called lookalike. Here's a really cool thing. If you're trying to reach 100,000 users, and this media site only has 75,000 users, they'll find you 25,000 users based on lookalikes. They'll look for other people who act and behave like you do, 
and then they'll throw those in there. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the right ones, but it's better than just saying, hey, spray my ad all over and find me 25,000 people, right? We can target a whole bunch of different ways how we do this. We're not going to spend time on this because there's just too much and that's not going to get us there. So let me give you a last couple of things and then I want to leave it open for some questions. John, has anybody asked a question we need to worry about right now? Not yet. Okay, cool. Because I don't know if there's anyone out there. So, all right, ad blocking. If you guys are ad blocking, it's cool. I get it, right? You do it. I get it. But if you stop and think about it, ad blocking uh, is a symptom of a bigger problem that is really bad ads, right? People don't really mind ads if they're good ads. It's when I get followed by that pair of Zappos shoes or whatever the case may be. Ad blocking is an issue. It's flattening out. But if you stop and think about publishers out there who are selling ads and you're not paying for it, now they don't get the money, right? Because they can't sell the ads. You get the content. They don't get anything for that as well. I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use an ad blocker. That's up to you. What I'm saying is this. The industry has to do a better job of making it so you don't mind watching ads in return for the content that you're getting, whatever that content may be. Ad fraud. Um, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of what's called NHT, non-human traffic. There's a lot of bots out there. Here's what will happen. You go to a site and you scroll down and there's a video there and the video starts to play, but this is maybe a really uh, disreputable website. They've actually stacked three more videos behind it. You don't even see it, but it starts to play all of them and an ad goes and they charge four people for an ad for one person. That's ad fraud. Happens quite a bit. And to the tune of somewhere between five and a half and nine and a half billion dollars worth of advertising that's lost on an annual basis because of fraud, because of bots, because of things like that. So to wrap this up, I want to do uh, two more real quick, okay? Um, so one of the things you have to do if you're going to sell media is know how to price it. And there's a lot of different ways that it gets priced. So if you are not a math major, don't worry about it. That's okay because they're pretty easy, right? One of the most frequent ones is called cost per thousand, CPM. If you speak a Latin language, mill is thousand, right? So cost per thousand. So if I show a thousand ads... I get charged for that 1,000 ads and then another 1,000, another 1,000. So here's how this works. If I've been quoted a $5 CPM, cost per 1,000, and my ads are shown uh, 5,000 times, someone tell me what that would cost. Say it again. $5. $5. Nice. But what did you not, leave, what did you not get in there? Uh, time, or yeah. Yep. So it's times Okay, the there you go. That's okay. That's okay. Everybody, when they first do this, like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. If I charge you $5,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> if I charge you $5 for every thousand ads and I show you five ads, $5 times five, 25 bucks. Okay. People have a hard time at very first. Pretty soon you're all good with it. Here's an easier one. Okay. Cost per click. So you've quoted me a $5 cost per click and I've got 500 clicks. Someone can do that one for me. Say it loud. 2,500. All right, let me see what we got in here. How about a pen? How about an orange pen? Sure. All right, 2,500 bucks, okay? Every time someone clicks, I pay for it. Who bears the risk when it comes to a cost per click? If I show the ad and no one clicks, do I get paid? I don't get paid. So the publisher bears a lot of risk on that, okay? In this prior one, I show the ads and no matter if there are no clicks, I get paid as a publisher, so the advertiser bears a risk. There's risk on both sides here, but... Um, Let's do one more. You know what? I don't think we're going to have time because it's, we haven't set it up, so we won't worry about it. That's fine. That's fine. Just know that there are a lot of different ways that ads get sold and a lot of ways that they're calculated. You do not have to be a math major. If you can make a calculator work, you're going to be fine. And after you've done it for a while, it's going to work for you. So let me wrap up with this. A quote by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I can't 100% certain say it's from him. It's like the one that... Uh, Abraham Lincoln, right, uh, that you, never mind, never mind, okay. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, right? Um, if you think about it, this happens all the time with businesses. My advertising isn't working, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop advertising. It's the worst thing you could do. If your advertising isn't working, don't stop advertising, fix the advertising. Start targeting the right people, start going to the right sites to buy your ads. The last thing you should do is to stop advertising, because if the lifeblood of a company is sales and you don't have any advertising, you don't have any sales. So... I'm going to end with this uh, that I started with, okay? I'm going to tell you this. 
you're going to leave here and go, that dude was so full of it. I hate ads. That was a big waste of my time. And that's okay, right? That's okay. What I'm here to say to you is this. I love the media world. That's the world that I work in. I absolutely love it. I love everything about what I get to do when it comes to selling ads and everything else because I do believe that people read what they are interested in and sometimes that's an ad. I do believe that nothing happens until someone sells something and so the sales have to occur. I'm a capitalist at heart. That's what businesses are for is to sell something, to solve a problem for someone and to enrich the owners and the workers and everything else. So I'm simply going to close with this. If you're participating in the Pinterest contest, I hope you kill it. I hope you have a really great time. If you're not, I hope you got something from this that was of value to you. And if you didn't, either of those, you're not going to participate, you need any value, just don't tell me, okay? It's cool, we'll, we'll be all right, right? It's, it's really okay. But any questions that I can answer with the last five minutes? There was not a lot, a lot of time to leave for questions, I'm sorry. The question is, can I get out of here? Please, yeah, go. So two kind of stories I've seen recently. One was somebody was uh, in an emergency situation, they had to go to a hospital, and the first ad that was on Google Maps was actually like twice as far because that hospital had paid more. And then another one was somebody's grandma was like choking, they tried to watch a YouTube video on C or whatever, and there was an ad first. So how do you think those kind of things where these advertisers are paying to be first on the list or shown out before the video, yeah. but it's impacting the users in potentially a life-threatening situation. Okay. Is that going to affect things in the future? Okay, I love, I love that question, and I could go on and on about that. That's absolutely great. Let me give you, let me try to answer it a couple ways. Um, last uh, 2017, end of 2016, 2017, YouTube had an absolutely terrible time because it was found out that a whole bunch of ads were being shown next to ISIS beheading, beheading video, videos and so forth, right? One of the things that you always deal with in advertising is brand safety. Do I want my ad next to that content, right? So you want to make sure that your ad is only going to be seen where it should be seen. I go back to my days at KSL.com, and we would have stories about murder. We'd have stories about uh, crashes and so forth, and there's an ad right there, right? Some people are like, I don't want to do that. I absolutely get that. The, the YouTube thing, yeah, YouTube is set up to make money. I guess, and I'm not being flippant, I guess that means if, you're, if someone's choking, YouTube's probably not the place to go because there's going to be an ad there, right? I don't know how to solve that. Um, and then if I'm buying the ad and I paid more than the hospital right there and someone got that ad, I, I get all of that. I don't have a real great answer right now, but um, there's probably a way that we could do a better job of targeting, right? If I knew that you were watching that uh, choking video because you needed to save someone, I could turn the ad off, but I just don't know that. If I knew that you had blood gushing out your arm and you needed to get to a hospital, that's why, for me, targeting is so important. That's why knowing about who's there and what their intent is could help me to do what I need to do. Great question, though. Someone else? Yeah. So I don't know if you can answer this question for me, but it seems to me that we could be having a conversation. Pick up our mobile device, and there's an ad that relates to that conversation. Yeah, the device is claiming they're not listening to us. Yeah, yeah. Are they? Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you with certainty. Um, but there's been enough uh, in the news that situations where someone said something to a spouse and, and it got played back, right? How can Alexa answer when you call her name if she's not always listening, right? My watch right now, if I say, Siri, right? She's going to wake up, right? They have to be always listening. That's something that might be an issue. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Go ahead, John. I have a question. So for those that are competing, there's a ton of meat and potatoes that you want to What are some top principles that they need to understand to be successful? Okay. Number one, first and foremost, if you want to be successful with an advertiser, you have to understand what they're trying to do. What is success and how do they measure it? Okay. If this advertiser is trying to do branding, branding is different than direct response. Branding, I get my name out there and hope one day you'll think about me. Direct response, I need a call to action that will get you to buy something right now. A brand ad and a direct response ad are completely different. They're also measured differently. So number one is make sure that you understand what the advertiser is trying to do and how they're going to measure success so that at the end of the campaign, it's as successful as possible. Second of all, understand that the ad matters. The creative matters. 
if, if it's a branding ad, it can be nice and pretty and everything else. If it's a direct response ad, it's got to have a call to action that makes you do something. Download now, call now, do this, do that. I've seen direct response ads that forgot the phone number. Literally, call now for 15% off, no phone number. That's a big mistake, right? So the creative really matters. And then the third thing is, uh, a third of many, but the third that comes to mind right this moment is, make sure that you are getting absolutely brand safe uh, media. That you aren't putting that ad, obviously in Pinterest case, that's perfect media, right? But if you are working with other media companies, that that really great ad that you designed that does have a phone number doesn't show up next to some piece of content that you don't want to be associated with. So those are a couple, John. Any last questions? Okay, it's 4.15. Listen, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You uh, have been great. You answered some really great, asked some really great questions. And if I can answer anything afterwards, please, but go do what you need to do. Thanks a lot.